Well, welcome to Resonate, everyone. Um, this is a show which started with me chatting with my mates, uh, asking what's resonating with them in this cultural moment, sometimes recorded on the move, walking around the local park. It was my way of keeping fit, Simon, during lockdown. So I chatted <laughs> with my... <laughs> it was killing two birds with one stone. So I chat with mates who are doing interesting things in community and business. And Simon today ticks both these boxes. Simon Thomas is an old friend and colleague, former church leaders in the same network, pioneering church planting. He's the founder of City to City, uh, a catalyst for conversation, innovation and transformation to inspire individuals and reshape cities. I've been to a couple of City to City gatherings and they are absolutely amazing leaders and pioneers from all spheres of life gathered to dream and reimagine their cities. Simon is also CEO of J49 Housing, a registered social housing provider in London, and uh, we'll hear more about that shortly. What I love about my mate Simon is his ability to generate adventure and fun. I've had the privilege of traveling together with him on several wild adventures in earlier days. We experienced uh, a mini revival, didn't we, in Denmark, that was those trips were incredible and on our east africa trip to togo that was full of miracle interventions <laughs> mainly just getting us through lagos i think i was so my prayer life uh, really went through the roof during that trip but uh, it's great to travel and be with simon he also he always generates fun and it's a, a privilege to be with him he's really full of joy and uh, such an inspiration um, I've also had first-hand experience of Simon's passion for sailing. You've just sailed mm -hmm. around the UK, is that right, Simon? Yeah, for, uh, to Norway and then around the UK, yeah. To Norway and back and around the UK. How did that go? Yeah, fantastic. Amazing. It's just phenomenal to see all the land and, and places from the sea rather than from, from the land. It's just a completely different perspective on life. It's amazing. And you've got a, is it 26 foot yacht? I don't know how. 50 how... foot, amazingly. Yeah. Yeah. I sound like a millionaire, but that's <laughs> completely the opposite to everything. But it's an old 1970s boat, um, aluminium, and it's, yeah, very seaworthy, but also very adventure orientated. So it sailed the Atlantic seven times. Yes. Well, I, I've seen you at the helm of it and you, you, you look the part, that's for sure. So, Simon, one of the things that you've pioneered is city to city. So tell us a bit about that. What is city to city? So we were really trying to unravel, um, and this goes back to relationships with Phil and lots of other of our friends as well. How do we engage the different elements of life and bring our faith right into the centre of it, but in a very active way? So we were looking to say, OK, so we might be a Christian, we might be involved in education, which I've been involved in for years, both as a teacher and a um, senior manager. And where does our, our faith, our Christianity engage with that world? And the problem we were finding was that it really works when you're in one single area, like in education, because you can reimagine that space. The difficulty is you get stuck really quickly, like all of us. We hit brick walls. We find places where things don't work. So we thought for a long time, how do we interact with different groups in society and people with different callings and then find some space to solve a problem together, solve an issue together? So if we combined all those areas, what would an artist have to say to a scientist? What would an educationalist have to say to a, a care worker? And are there interactions between those, both as people of faith, but also people with particular callings where we can throw in ideas that changes that space, changes that thinking and changes the innovation? Great. So that's the general sort of idea. It's I've been in those groups and the buzzing of ideas is phenomenal, isn't it? It just it's it's when people take what are actually listening to what other people, how other people are viewing their community and their businesses. And there's something really unique about the way City City frames the conversation that because it's not all about money, is it? That's the key. No, it's not all about money. So give you a simple example. So I was working with some scientists and some artists in Dublin and really they were on different planets, completely different planets. The scientists were very much in their space trying to solve issues of 
biochemistry. These guys are professors in University Trinity College Dublin and a couple of artists who are off the planet, kind of crazy art style. And so we got them together for a conversation and really there was there was seemingly no connection whatsoever. But the result was, is not necessarily through that conversation, but through other means, is there's created these spaces called science cafes. And science cafes was an interaction between art and the sciences. And so these guys finally came together and there was a conversation between senior, you know, leaders of Trinity College Dublin and artists, et cetera. Um, and they created this incredible innovative space because science is so full of art. Mm. And of course, art is a mapping out of the innovation and the imagination of science. So it seemed a natural interconnection between those two worlds. So in a way, when you think there's a long way between the um, the spheres and the areas, in fact, there's really masses of crossover ground. And then when you get that together, you dream all sorts of ideas because scientists are dreamers anyway. Mm. That's amazing. I love that sense of the imagination and it is that interconnectivity of each of these spheres which seems to get lost in the way that people do do life in, in our current culture isn't it that things seem to get pigeonholed yeah very it, it, so I'll give you another simple example we did a city city in southampton um a few years ago just before the famous covid world and they were i said to them look you know just answer one question that's all you need to do just go for one question and let's bring together people from all across the city who can do that from the leaders of the council to mps to local businesses to local people to the university to the football club to everything so we had all of them in the room and i said what's the question we said actually bizarrely this is street homelessness we just can't crack it we can't crack the issue we don't know what to do so let's bring all those areas together. And they brought business as well. And one of the really interesting things that came out very early during the conversation over a couple of days was the business guy said, why have you never asked us about this? These guys are sleeping outside our shops. They're sleeping outside our businesses, but you've never come to us. You've come to the organizations. You've come to the charities. You've come to the kind of council, but you've never talked to us. And they were in the room and they said, we've got a fund of a million pounds. That's great. Um, we've built it together. Why don't we throw some of that into help solve the problem? Let us be involved. So that was an immediate outcome in the first few hours, simply because somebody was brought into the conversation. That's that's brilliant. And I think that's what City City does so well. It draws people into the conversation and gets them into the same room so that they can attack, tackle a common issue that everybody sees in their community. Um, but you can... I think the, the imagination and the resources is what's really inspiring, I think, in relation to what the conversations are that you're you're generating, Simon. Yeah. I, mean, I, I do. I mean, I like the gentrification issue is one that we're constantly, you know, talking about in different ways in the city here in London. So rough areas around where I live, you know, get suddenly um, torn down and these massive blocks get thrown up. But um, that's an area I know you've got a, a particular interest in. The whole yeah, ab absolutely. I think it's a it's a really, I, I think it's a really difficult blend. I don't think society works by singularity, so it never works by ghettoizing any particular group or organisation or, you know, social group of people. And whether it's a big housing estate or whether it's a big um, private development, we do need to interact those spaces. And where we don't live in a kind of, you know, non-status society and where we don't live in a society where things are fair, money is fair, systems are fair, we have to make sure that we somehow find ways to integrate those worlds. And it's a fine balance. So the integration in Peckham has been complicated because... Lots of artists have been very innovative, very dynamic, very creative in their business sense. That and seems, then develop, that yeah, seems to be the pattern, doesn't it? You get yes. artists that move yeah. into places that are quite edgy and then they they start opening up, um, turning abandoned buildings into uh, galleries and art spaces, which kind of then draws the interest of some of the uh, the young professionals and uh, they start to think, oh, this place is on the turn. 
and uh, I, I I think I'll because and also where cheaper property is available, obviously they move in, but then it starts a process rolling. I mean, we saw it in Camberwell, even when we opened our cafe um, in the high street there, that there was a, a sudden a buzz of interest in terms of building and uh, regeneration. But it, it, it does seem to follow the artists, that they seem to be the, the forerunners of it. Spot on. I think that's absolutely spot on. I think they create, generate the interest, the kind of out-of-the-box thinking and then it creates some space for people to come in. And I think the balance is perhaps another passionate issue of mine is the balance of this famous word ownership. Mm. Um, who runs it? Who owns it? How is it pulled together? And that's the fine line of community. Mm. Dynamic communities will contain all kinds of people and all kinds of backgrounds and all kinds of, you know, financing but i think it doesn't have to but ownership is the key so in the terms of peckham and probably very similar to camberwell it was all about well who will own this building in the end who will own this big creative arts building and mm. does a developer own it and if if so are they going to dictate what goes on and i think all those things then become really difficult yeah and then you get the the the, the slightly down at heel artists getting driven out of the area because they can't afford to stay there any longer Exactly so they, right. Exactly. They're going to find the next um, down at heel area. To, <laughs> to... Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Because I think that the issue of who controls, who owns, who takes the power base, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I yeah. went to just interesting aside, but I went to um, a housing association in Tower Hamlets the other day, run by a Christian guy called Poplar Harcourt. It's sort of came out of the '90s when they offloaded loads of social housing to housing associations and he picked up about 5,000 housing units from in really bad condition and what they decided was we're going to have a cross-section of people always it's always going to happen but we need to keep community at the heart of everything that goes on and we're not going to keep finance at the heart we're not going to keep you know, just good housing, which they want good housing. We're not going to keep private versus, you know, rented housing versus social housing. We're going to keep community at the heart of it. Everything we do has to have community-based, community connections, community centres, you know, orientation for the kind of most needed group in that area. And they've built a phenomenal base mm. of community, 15,000 homes they manage now. And it's just something out of a revelation it's a model really for lots of community all over the country wow that's amazing so tell me a little bit about um J uh, j49 housing how did that come about so i think um both phil and i have known over the years that that housing is a massive issue in cities particularly for all of us how do we manage it how do we live in it do we rent it do we buy it do we try and do something else in it we always thought we need to try and approach this with a, a different hat, a different thinking. So one of our thoughts when we were in London was the same as everywhere else, couldn't afford to live. Even in the 90s, couldn't afford to live in London, weren't earning enough money, couldn't buy anything. So our idea was, well, let's just build something. We can do it cheaper, we can do it better. So in the end, long story short, but we, we built our own house in central Peckham behind a big housing estate on the Ledbury estate, bought an old garage site, for about 10, 12,000 quid and built our own house. And from that process thought, actually it is possible if we approach this not from money, but from community to rethink the whole idea. So we formed another organization called Habitat for Humanity with the UK version of it. And then we went from there to a, uh, a company that could work commercially. And then eventually thought, well, the best way to be in there is to rethink housing associations. And it's not that they're all bad. It's just suddenly that they've become very big developers rather than social housing, community based organizations. They used to be local. They used to be for people in particular localities. They used to be part of what you might call almost like a community bank, but in the housing terms. And so we were trying to think, should we reinvent it from a Christian faith point of view? Should we rethink it? So we called J49 because it's Jubilee 49, you know, 49th year. And our slogan is break the debt, release the resource. Mm -hmm. So we want to release the resource of community whilst breaking the debt and the pressure over people's lives in terms of unaffordable housing. 
Brilliant. So that's our route. But get, becoming a housing association is a complete nightmare. <laughs> I have to tell you. <laughs> I've journeyed a little bit through those um, prayer moments with you guys. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> don't do it Let's anyone you back up because you just said at the beginning of that um you built your own house in peckham so yeah. i just want to dig onto that one a little bit because not many people can uh can build their own houses or or can they what did you find out during that journey well if you remember phil you've probably forgotten that you and julie were there as the house was arriving and there's a picture of julie standing there in the snow um so that's the first when it was built. So you guys were very much involved in that whole process and prayerfully, but also physically coming around to help us at times. So the idea was we got it from a guy, a bunch of Christians in Cornwall, and they said, well, why don't you just build a log cabin? And we said, well, it might be a bit tricky planning wise to put a log cabin in the center of Peckham. <laughs> so we kind of went on this journey of saying, you know, every site developer goes for, are we ever going to do it? But a friend of ours got the kind of vision and one day completely randomly he's never done this before or since he went into an auction place um, and ended up bidding for a piece of land in Peckham and got it and he just got given a bit of money from his his um, family um, so he came around to dinner one day and he said well, I've got the land and I said what do you mean you've got the land he said well I just bought the land I've never done it in my life and I don't know what I was doing but I just ended up with this piece of land in Peckham do you want it <laughs> so we got this piece of land from for about 12 grand in the end and uh then thought let's go and build a wooden house but we need to put brick on the outside so we did a scandinavian eco design so we did the most environmental house that we could in the 90s um and built the house on the land with a bit of help from some friends the actual company that helping us build went bankrupt halfway through so it was all hair raisingly <laughs> easy <laughs> You know, money coming from all sorts of places, but we ended up with a home and a house, which we've extended and extended and extended. We've got people now living in very low rents and social rents as a kind of mini community. That's remarkable. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an inspiration. I'm just uh, remembering some of the situations and the early times. But yeah, you had this big frame, didn't you, that you... Arrested. That's right. <laughs> and uh, I remember looking at that and thinking how is this ever going to result in a home to live in <laughs> well julie was standing your wife was standing there outside in the snow as some of the frame was arising as the crane was there saying kind of what's going on but it was quite it's quite a funny picture i'll, I'll dig it out for you some point but it, it just shows that there is community involved it wasn't just us it yes. was guys like you other people who were part of that because we're sharing those experiences together. And it was a very community experience at the time, which I think we were all very committed to as well. Such a powerful story. You're going to have to write the book, Simon. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to write the book. <laughs> You're better than I am. <laughs> so, listen, one of the things we were talking about when we were um, uh, met up at the New Year um, was this whole issue of the, the the three relationships of the church being the up and the in and the out yeah and you know that so often the church gets preoccupied over preoccupied with the upward relationship which is absolutely healthy with the deepening their relationship with god and doing the worship and devotional thing and teaching and um and then they have plenty of, of family uh, expressions and relational uh, community building which is brilliant but that outward service which is the the third leg of the three-legged stool i always talk about in terms of what church looks like that is often the hardest one to sustain and keeping an outward focus um of serving um is one of the things that i think you're quite passionate about as, as i watch you and i've listened to you over the years it's how do we engage in a meaningful way and how do we keep so I'm just wondering what your reflections are in terms of how do we can continually call churches to do that outward engagement thing? I think it's a brilliant question and observation, Phil. I think it's absolutely spot on. I think the issue is you just get absorbed with the territory you're in. So if you're in a church, you get absorbed with the elements that you do, the things that you produce, the the kind of way of trying to help people be disciples. But the best way for people to be disciples is to be disciples in the world and not of it, as Jesus said. 
And the way to be there is to be fully engaged with society. So we talk about a thin wall between heaven and earth. We talk about a thinner and thinner wall between ourselves as brothers and sisters and being part of a wider family we call the church. But we talk about a massive great big barrier then between us and everybody else. And I think that wall is very thin and very mm. fragile. And right. actually, as there are people. Yeah. yeah, as you do. And so you suddenly find that all kinds of people who've got all sorts of elements of faith in life and in society, and they're not unwilling to engage or disengage or have conversations, but they just don't have that opportunity. So the more that we're in those places, whichever sphere or area that God's placed you in, the barriers are very thin and very open and sometimes very fragile. Mm. And if we can call those in and be a part of them and encourage churches to almost release all the people in their particular community into those areas. And, and you've been doing lots of this, I know, Phil, over the years, in the last 15 and 20 years, and particularly in the last 10 years. And I think it's absolutely vital because then we find ourselves in unbelievable conversations just because God can place it anywhere. You know, with the whole thing of we're six steps away from anybody, mm. but actually probably one or two steps away from anyone you like. Mm. And I find myself in conversations with, you know, people on the street and people in government. It, it, mm. There really should be no difference between those two worlds because they're just people on the planet trying to find their way. Mm. So I, I mean, think once that it, becomes an invisible barrier rather than a big wall, it becomes a different conversation. That's that's the challenge, isn't it? Keeping people aware and, and building confidence in their ability that their skill sets are completely transferable. You know, the, the, so often churches are great at com creating community, um, but just to take that through that wall uh, and that thin barrier into the community and where they are. I think one of the things that my Julie discovered, my, uh, my wife um, engaging with the local park, she was just drawn into their the, the bosom of their embrace as as somebody because she was just good at creating community and yeah uh, and so that was her offering to this the, the group the steering group of, uh, who developed the park and that park has just become such an incredible community hub I mean that's what it was a gift from uh, Victorians to uh, uh, to the community to keep healthy um and for the local people so it's 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 in trust there but it's basically has to have a living community in order for it to, to be sustainable. And, and Julie has found that her gifts, her skill sets were completely transferable in terms of what they were trying to do. So much so that they asked us to do training for them in relation to legacy building, in, a, in, in relation to the park, some of the park leaders around Lambert, Brilliant. which we really enjoyed doing. And um, so those conversations, as you say, they're just a, uh, 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 an arm's reach away and you've got them in your street because you've told me about loads of those you've had over the years and just local neighbors and they just happen to be running old film companies or half the government and th there's just it's very simple stuff at the end of the day but i think we are we are still very um troubled by status and i think we don't interact at certain levels and we feel kind of trapped you know we're the christians we're in the church what are we um, and although that is true, and we will find complicated, difficult, even some might say persecuted kind of conversations at times, but I, st I still think one of the things that Jesus brought beyond anything else was there's no status in the kingdom of heaven. And the status That's issue prevents us because we then come up against institutions and people operate within their institutions. And what we can do as Christians is we, we can walk down and say, actually, this is all a very kind of completely fabricated barrier it doesn't exist you can create it and we can agree that it exists between us in a conversation to bring some formality but once you cross over those things whether it's a local authority whether it's the gla whether it's local government or whether it's a big science institution which whichever it is they've all got their ways of creating a a sphere a tower um a, a silo of some sort and we have to bring them down. That's the dividing wall has been broken down, but we're very bad at realizing that it actually doesn't exist. Mm. How would we best to pursue that conversation and grapple with this uh, this intimidation over status? What would be a good route, discipleship route for that, Simon? Any thoughts? I, th 
I think it's a really brilliant question. I think it has to start internally in your own way of understanding other people and your own security in your sense of calling and who you are in God. Because if it doesn't start there, you feel intimidated by any level which challenges who you are as a person. My, I'll be very honest, my biggest intimidation when I was growing was being in the city and being with people of power and finance and money. And I used to sit in conversations with that, listen and think, I don't know anything about this. These guys are completely secure. They're switched on. But as the years went on, and you realize that that was a very fragile area, and actually these people were very frightened, scared, sometimes very insecure people, mm. that more and more, I remember one guy, I won't mention the bank, senior guy in a bank, massive global bank, called me into his office when I was in the room one day, and he said, look, my life is a complete and utter mess. Um, you know, this is all a complete front. I've got this great big office. I'm earning a fortune. He said, but what's the point? This is completely irrelevant so immediately you come inside the territory where you need to remain secure you need to remain in where you're called to be mm. and then you need other things then to to kind of break down their own barriers and let those barriers break down around you and some people don't want to they want to keep the barrier forever because it's a safe secure place for them to be but i think if we teach people for security you know I always say that security is a key aspect of being a christian Mm. Uh, but actually security and identity go together mm. and when you put those two things together we're secure in what we identify ourselves to be and we identify in the place that we find ourselves secure mm. and whenever those two are challenged we find ourselves as disciples in really mm. uh, intimidating positions and we don't function properly then mm. i'm reminded of jesus's simple injunction do not fear um, yeah uh, brilliant isn't it do not, do not fear of those who can kill the body but fear god who can who destroy soul and body yeah um, it's so it's a waste of our i mean fear is a healthy emotion in some respects isn't it it keeps us from um from danger um in some aspects but um and it's like how do we keep it in the healthy place rather than the bad the go to the dark side of fear yeah it's exactly that's spot on and I think, you know, perfect love casts out fear and all those things we quote. But yeah. I think it it is about that internal security. And if you build that into people's, you know, discipleship and their connection, they can function in unbelievable places. I, mean, I just I do a street pass of training once, one of the other areas I've been involved in. And I was getting a lift back to the station. And I just asked the guy, I said, look, I don't want to ask you what you do because I'm more concerned with who you are as a person. But, you know, just what what do you do in your kind of day job <laughs> and he said i'm a nuclear engineer and i said oh my goodness what, what what does that mean he said well he said we've got this secret society of global nuclear power station engineers where i can speak to people from all over the world about nuclear power plants and stuff like that i said have you ever thought about your christianity and he said not until today <laughs> Said. i've never thought about talking to them about those things because we're in our kind of area and mm. i said you, you've got an influence and a connection into all these guys lives living in massively complicated situations doing plants which some people hate some people like some people think environment some people think don't and here you are as a christian a believer in it um and i think yeah that was a brilliant conversation i think i missed my train but it was worth it to think well, yeah. here's a normal guy in a church and yeah. he's got a global network. Yeah. And they're all sitting in our churches. That's absolutely true. They're all there. Yeah. They're all there, just wandering around, sitting in the chairs or pews or whatever the church scene is. Yeah. And they could be unlocked and released and we could be blessed by their stories and their interactions could be amazing. Wow. Well, mate, I love what you're doing and I love who you are. And um, I just uh, want to thank you for coming on and sharing some of your story here today. Um, is there any resources or books or anything you'd recommend for people to get a hold of? I could probably. I mean, you're you're the resource man, Phil, of all books. <laughs> it's better than I am. I think I read. Um, I mean, obviously, I, Sam Wells um, is a great person for me um, out of St Martin's in the Field because he's a thinker outside the box. Mm -hmm. So if you've never explored any of Sam Wells kind of into thinking that it's worthwhile mm -hmm. and there's probably loads of guys in uh, those areas, but I would encourage people to read 
a little bit outside of their area. I mean, I get new scientists. I'm not a scientist by roots, mm. but I want to discover what's in the thinking and direction of some yeah. people as they're developing areas. So if you're, you're not someone who does that, maybe just occasionally jump yourself into someone else's that's, world because it can really brilliant. open your mind. That's brilliant advice. I, I love reading about neuroscience and uh, aspects of, of that area. Uh, just because it just you recognize that most people are dabbling and in looking into this sort of area and it's just useful to have something to say about them. it opens the, sometimes it just opens the conversation for people doesn't it absolutely yeah, yeah. knowing a little bit about their world I think. yeah exactly great yeah. i'll put a link to sam wells uh in the yeah that'd be brilliant video. um mate our time is up but thank yeah. you so much for this conversation and um i think we're going to have to do this again uh, yeah love to get another session in and dig a little deeper around these issues but yeah you've, you've really got me thinking and i know a lot of people will be thinking more deeply about how to make these connections and how to act with out fear and i think that's the key is keeping the outward focus and uh and being bold so hey thank you very much simon pleasure great to see you we'll see you again soon see you soon okay take care Thank mm-hmm. you.